Welcome to copying and pasting. By the end of this video, you should be able to copy and paste text and files and recognize some common situations where copying and pasting will save you a lot of time. The first thing you might be asking yourself is what exactly is copying and pasting? Copying simply means that you want your computer to copy a piece of information and paste simply means you want to move that information to a different area within a program or on the hard drive. You can copy and paste text or images from one program to another or from one area of a program to another area of the same program. You can also copy and paste files from one storage area and paste them to another area. One of the most common uses of copy and paste is to move text around a Word document. Since we're going to need to right click and left click with the mouse to copy and paste, the first thing we're going to need to do is to identify the right mouse button and the left mouse button. If you look at your mouse, the left mouse button is on the left and is usually clicked with your index finger. The right mouse button is on the right and is clicked with your middle finger. Now let's open a sample Word document so we have some text to copy. In order to copy our text we must first move our mouse cursor to the text that we want to copy in the Word document and left click. The cursor should now show a flashing line where you have left clicked. Now we need to highlight the text that we want to copy. This is done by clicking on the left mouse button at the beginning of the text you want to highlight and holding the left mouse button down and dragging the mouse in the direction you want to highlight. When you are done, release the left mouse button. Now let's try it ourselves. The first thing we need to do is left click in the document at the place where we want to start copying. Now I want to hold the left mouse button and drag the mouse in the direction we want to highlight our text. Release the mouse button and now we have highlighted our text. Now that we have some highlighted text, we need to right click on the highlighted text. Move your mouse cursor so that it's hovering over the highlighted text and click the right mouse button. A menu should come up asking you if you want to uh, cut, copy, paste, change font, etc. We need to move our cursor over the copy option and left click. We have now copied our text. As a side note, when you right click to copy, you must right click on the highlighted text. If you right click anywhere else, your text will no longer be highlighted and the copy and paste menu will not appear. Now that we have copied our text, how can we use it? In order to paste our text, we must first move our mouse cursor to the place in the document where we want to place our text. Then we have to left click the cursor at the place where we want to place our text. Now we need to right click at the same spot and the menu will come up giving us some options. We want to move our mouse cursor to paste and left click to choose paste. And we're going to choose the first one that says keep source formatting. The pasted text is now at the end of our document. We have now copied and pasted text from one area of a program to another area of the same program. But what if we want to copy text from one program to a different program? For example, at the bottom of this document is a web address. We can copy this web address from our Word document and paste it into the address bar of a web browser. This will keep us from having to remember the address and type it from memory. Let's do so now. Move the mouse cursor to the bottom of the page where the web address is. Then left click at the start of the web address and hold down the left mouse button and drag the mouse cursor over the web address to highlight it. Move the mouse cursor over the highlighted text and right click. 
move the mouse cursor over the copy option and left click on copy. Now let's open our browser and go up to the address bar. I will open Internet Explorer because it's the one that's usually easiest to find as the blue E in the bottom left of the screen. When it comes up, I will left click at the top in the address bar. This should highlight the text in the address bar. I'll hit the delete key to delete this text. And now we have a blank address bar. Next we right click at the start of the blank address bar and move our cursor over to paste. Left click on paste. And now we have the web address in our address bar. Hit enter. And it takes us to our web page without having to remember any of the typing to get the long address in there to get there. We have now copied and pasted information from one program to another program. You can copy and paste text from one document into another document, from a document to a web page, or from a web page into a document, etc. You can also copy and paste files. Let's open my computer and look at see what files are in my documents folder. Go to the start menu in the lower left. Left click on computer. On the left, see Documents, left click on Documents. And as you can see from the list, there's a file named researchpaper.docx. We don't want it here. We want the file to be on our removable flash drive. Maybe we accidentally saved it here in the default save place by hitting save instead of hitting save as and specifying where we wanted to save it. We can copy and paste this file from the documents folder onto our flash drive so we can take it with us. In order to do this, we need to right click on the file we want to copy, which is researchpaper.docx. I'm going to move my mouse cursor over it and right click. When the menu comes up, we'll move our mouse cursor over the copy option and left click on copy. We have now copied the file. Now we need to go to our flash drive, left click on the drive that is your removable storage drive. Mine is removable disk E, so I'm going to left click on that. Once we're here, we right click on the area where it tells us what files are on the flash drive on the right in the blank area. When the menu comes up, we move our mouse cursor over paste and left click on it. The Word file now resides on our flash drive. We have now copied a file from one location of our computer to another location of storage. Before we end our lesson, let's go over the key terms we learned. Left click. To left click is to press the left mouse button with your index finger. It should make a clicking sound. Right click. To right click means to press the right mouse button with your middle finger. It should make a clicking sound. Highlight. In order to copy and paste, you need to highlight the text. In order to highlight text, left click at the beginning of the text, hold down the left mouse button, drag the mouse in the direction you want to highlight, and then release the left mouse button when you've highlighted all the text you want. Copy. Copying means you want to copy a piece of information into the computer's temporary memory. Paste. Pasting means you want to create a copy of whatever information you've copied to the computer's temporary memory in a new location. In this lesson, we learned how to copy and paste text from one area of a program to another area of the same program, from one program to another program. We also learned how to copy and paste files from one area of storage to another area of storage. I hope you learned something, and as always, if you have any more questions, email me at fmatthews at southwest.tn.edu. Welcome to Understanding My Print. 
By the end of this lesson, you should know the rules of printing with the MyPrint system. New this semester is the MyPrint printing system. The main features of the MyPrint initiative are that students will receive $35 in print credits each semester. Print credits are allotted to student accounts three weeks before classes start. The total amount of printing this $35 pays for is 700 black and white single-sided pages. If you run out of print credit, you can add money to your print account at the My Print Pay stations in each of our libraries. Each page is five cents per single black and white page and 10 cents per color page. And wireless network printing is also available, which I will talk about in another video. When you log in, you should see a box in the upper right that shows the print balance you have for this semester. It should start out at $35. When you print, this box will change to reflect how much credit you have left. As you can see, this person has printed one page already and is down to $34.95. In the top right of the box, you see the words My Print Website. Clicking on this will bring you to the info page for the My Print system on the Southwest website. It lists all the information for this initiative and has further documentation for you to read about the program. In the bottom right of this box, you see the word details. If you click on this, it'll bring you to the My Print Administration website where you can log in and see a record of your print jobs. We will go over this more in the video using the My Print website and wireless printing. In order to test this, the first thing we need is something to print. Click on the Microsoft Word icon to open the program. Now that Word is open, let's type a sample sentence. This is what we want to print. Now hit enter until you get to the second page and type this is the second page. Let's print our document. We only want one copy. We want to print the entire document. We want to print on both sides of the page. Now let's click print. A print job notification box should now appear confirming the document name, the printer you're printing to, how many pages you're printing, and how much it will cost. If all this information looks correct, then click print and the print job will be sent to the printer. If it does not look correct, then hit cancel. We will now click on print. If we go back to our My Print account balance, we see that it has subtracted the correct amount from our account. Even though we only ended up with two pages, one was front and back, so our total was three pages subtracted from our account. Our example starting balance was $34.95, but $0.15 cents was subtracted, and it's now $34.80. Today we learned about some of the features and rules of the MyPrint system. I hope you learned something, and as always, if you have any more questions, please email me at fmatthews at southwest.tn. Welcome to using the advanced features of the MyPrint system. By the end of this lesson, you should know how to log in to your MyPrint account, how to use the web print feature to print from a mobile device, how to view your print summary, view your transaction history, view your recent print jobs, and view any print jobs that are pending release. There are many advanced features of MyPrint that will allow you to better manage your print jobs, print remotely, and be aware of how much you're printing. In order to access these features, the first thing we need to do is log into our MyPrint account. To do this, we need to get to the MyPrint login screen. There are multiple ways to get to the screen. One way is go to the MyPrint webpage at www.southwest.tn.edu slash myprint and click on the student user login. 
Another way is to click on details in the MyPrint dialog box that comes up when you log into the computer screen. And additionally, you can get to the MyPrint website by clicking on the MyPrint website in the dialog box as well. Once we are on this login page, we can use our normal Southwest login to get into our MyPrint account. I will type mine in, F Matthews, and then my password. Click login. The first thing that we see is our print summary. It tells us our username, our print balance, our total printing jobs, and the total number of pages we printed. The next thing we see is our activity graph. If you've spent your print balance, it'll show that it go down as you've printed print jobs. And at the bottom, there are some interesting facts about how much our printing for the semester has affected the environment. If we click on transaction history in the upper left, we will now see a list of our MyPrint transactions sorted by date. If we click on any of the headings, such as transacted by or amount, we can sort the list according to these parameters. This allows you to see when you added funds to your account and how much was added. If we click on the next option, Recent Print Jobs, it will give us a similar chart that tells us the date a job was printed, who the job was charged to, what printer the job was printed from, how many pages the job was, what the cost was for the job, the name of the document, the printer settings, and the status of the print job. Like the last page, we can sort the list according to any of these attributes by clicking on one of them at the top. For example, if we wanted to see the jobs with the most pages, we could click on Pages, and it'll sort the jobs according to how many pages each job contained. If we click on Jobs Pending Release, we can see if there are any print jobs that we told a program on the computer to print, but we've not yet hit the OK button on the MyPrint dialog box, which asks us to confirm each print job before it goes to the printer. We have the option to either Release All, which will send them all to the printer, or cancel all, which will cancel all pending print jobs. We can also refresh the page to see if there are any new print jobs that have been submitted since we opened this web page. The last feature we will explore is the web print feature. This allows you to print your document from anywhere you have an internet connection. This includes mobile devices such as laptops, tablets, or smartphones. In order to start the process, click on Submit a Job. The next screen will ask you which printer you want to print to. Click on the radio button beside the printer you wish to print your documents from. For example, if we were currently working on our laptop in the Parish Library on the Union Campus, we would choose the Union Avenue Campus Parish Library Printer. Once you've selected your printer, click on 2, Print Options and Account Selection. It will now ask us how many copies of our document we want to print. Let's leave it at 1 and click on 3, Upload a Document. One limitation of web print is that it only prints saved documents. The only types of documents that you can print are Microsoft Office PowerPoint, Excel, and Word documents, Microsoft XPS documents, and PDF documents. In order to select the document we want to print, click on Choose File and a file open dialog box will appear. I will then browse to wherever my file is. For this example, I'm going to go to my removable flash drive and I'm going to choose research paper dot docx. Next, click on upload and complete. The system will then upload your document and send it to the printer. You will get a message say at the top of the screen that says your job was successful. And the status of the job will tell you when it is finished rendering it and it has been sent to the queue for printing. And of course, if you're done with using your MyPrint account, you can click on Log Off to log out of the system. If you encounter problems printing, ask the staff in the library or at the help desk for assistance. If there are any other issues with printing or your print credit, call 333-HELP. Before we end our lesson, let's go over the key terms and phrases that we learned. Release a print job. 
This means you're approving a print job. When you send a document to the printer, it's held by the computer system until you approve slash release it to be printed by the printer. Upload a document. Uploading a document basically means you are giving slash uploading a copy of your document to a website or web server. Web print. Web print is a feature of the MyPrint system that allows you to upload a document from your mobile device and have it printed by a university printer at the location of your choice. Today we learned about how to log into our MyPrint account, use the web print feature to print from a mobile device, view our print summary, view our transaction history, view our recent print jobs, and view any print jobs pending release. I hope you learned something, and as always, if you have any more questions, please email me at fmatthews at southwest.tn.edu. Welcome to Printing with and Using the Advanced Printing Options of Microsoft Word in the Library. By the end of this lesson, you should know how to print your work from Microsoft Word and how to use the advanced printing options to choose a printer, print certain pages, and print double-sided. In order to test this, the first thing we need is something to print. Click on the Microsoft Word icon to open the program. Now that Word is open, let's type a sample sentence. This is what we want to print. Now hit enter until you get to the second page and type this is the second page. Click on the file tab in the upper left. On the file screen click on the print icon in the middle left. These are our printing options. Let's go over them one by one. When we have the settings how we want them and we want to print, the print icon is located in the upper left. We click on this to start our print job. Beside that icon is copies. If you want to print multiple copies of your document, you can do so by either typing in how many copies you want or clicking on the up and down arrow next to the copies box. Printers. If you click the Dan arrow on the right side of printers, a drop down will appear telling you all the different printers you can print to from this computer. Most printers such as ULIB01 and ULIB04 have stickers on the top of the actual printer showing you which printer they are. If one printer is out of paper or toner or won't print, you can try printing again by selecting a different printer from this dialog box. Now for settings. The first drop down in settings asks you what part of your document you want to print. The default setting is all pages. This will print all the pages of your document. If you only want to print certain pages of your document, there is a text box right below the setting labeled Pages. This allows you to specify what pages you want to print. In order to specify a page range, you need to put the number of the starting page, then a hyphen, and then the number of the final page. If we had a longer document, we could print a page range such as 1 to 14, or 5 to 25 or 3 to 8 etc. If you only want to print certain pages you can put each one in followed by a comma. For example, if you had 20 page document you could print page 8, page 11, and page 17 by typing 8, 11, 17. The next drop down box asks you if you want to print one sided or if you want to print on both sides. Our printers can print on both sides and it saves paper if you do so. But be aware that each page you print double sided still subtracts two pages from your MyPrint balance. The next option is collation, which only matters when you're printing multiple copies of your document and it determines in what order the pages are printed. The next option is portrait or landscape orientation. Portrait orientation is the default and is fine for a majority of your printing needs. 
If you have something that needs to go lengthways across the page because of its width, you can use landscape orientation to have it print more visibly. For example, if you had a large picture, if you change to landscape orientation, you can see more of the picture. The next option is paper size. The next option is margins. If you want to frame your document in a certain way, you can change the margins here. Usually though, you would change your margins in your Word document. This option is more useful for programs that don't let you set margins, such as if you were printing from a web browser. The last option is pages per sheet. The default is one. But if you want to fit more than one page on a sheet of paper, this will save paper and also lower your page count by a factor of however many pages you put per page. Two per page, halves the print, etc. Now that we know what all these settings do, let's print our document. We only want one copy. We want to print the entire document. And we want to print on both sides of the page. Now let's click print. Before we end our lesson, let's go over the key terms we learned. Page range. This is a range of pages which we want to print, such as 7 to 10, 1 to 30, etc. It's formatted by typing the first page in the range, then a hyphen, and then the last page in the range. Double sided. This means we want to print on both sides of the page. Today we learned about choosing a printer, choosing a page range, printing specific pages, printing one-sided or two-sided, portrait and landscape orientation, paper size, and pages per sheet. I hope you learned something, and as always, if you have any more questions, please email me at fmatthews at southwest.tn. Welcome to saving and opening a file to a specific folder, hard drive, or other storage device. By the end of this lesson, you'll know how to specify where on your computer you want to save your work to, and when you need to open your work, how to get to the place where you saved your file so you can open it. This lesson applies to any program that saves files, but today we'll just go over how to use Microsoft Word because it's one of the most common programs used to save your work. The same steps will work with any Windows program that saves files. The first thing we need is something to save. Let's open Microsoft Word by clicking on the blue W icon on the desktop. If it's not on your desktop, go to the Start menu, All Programs, Microsoft Office, and Microsoft Word. Now that the program is open, we need to just type some text. Anything will do. I will just type the sentence, this is a test. In order to save this file, I will click on the File tab in the upper left and click on Save. Since this is the first time that we have saved this document, it will ask us to name the file and choose where to save it. If the program did not give us these options, the file has already been saved once, so we would instead choose Save As in order to give the file a file name and to choose where to save it. In either case, the panel on the left shows us different places we could save our file. It shows folders, hard drives, and storage devices within our computer's file structure, which allow us to save our file to them. When we click on one of these, the panel on the right shows us all the things that are already saved in this location that could be opened by this program. For example, if we click on the desktop, it shows us all the Word documents that are already saved on the desktop. If we choose a removable flash drive, removable disk E, it shows us all the documents saved on our flash drive. Let's choose our flash drive and let's name our file save test. 
and click Save. Our file is now saved to our flash drive. Now that we have saved a file, let's see if we can open it. Close the file you're working on by clicking on File in the upper left and clicking on Close. Your file is now closed. Now click on File in the File tab in the upper left and click on Open. This will open a File Open dialog box we can use to browse for our file. This is very similar to the box we saw when we were saving our file. On the left are all the locations on this computer that you could have saved your file. Scroll down the list until you see our removable flash drive. Click on your removable disk. Ours is named E. And the box on the right will show you all the Word documents that have been saved on this device. Scroll down until you see the Save Test document. Click on this file. Now click on Open. We have now saved to and opened a file from a specific computer location. Before we end our lesson, let's go over the key terms we learned. File structure. The file structure is the way files and folders are arranged on various hard drives and removable disk drives on your computer. Browse for a file. This means to navigate through the file structure of your computer to find the location of a file. Today we learned how to save a Word document to a specific hard disk location and how to open it from that location. This process is very similar for any Windows program. I hope you learned something, and as always, if you have any more questions, email me at fmatthews at southwest.tn.edu. Welcome to saving a file by emailing it to yourself. By the end of this video, you should be able to attach a file to an email, address this email to yourself, send it to yourself, and access the attached file by opening it from your email inbox. First of all, why would you need to do this? The main reason is that when we email a file to ourselves, it saves the file to our email account, and we can access that file from any computer with internet access. This is useful if you don't have your flash drive with you, or you just want to make a backup of your file, just in case you lose your flash drive. The first thing we need to do is to save our file somewhere on the computer. The desktop is usually the easiest place to do so. For this example, we will quickly make a Word file, but you can do so with any type of file. Open Word, type a few words, test, test, this is a test, click on File, click on Save, choose the desktop, name the file test file and click on save. I now have a document saved to the desktop that I can use for this example. Suppose I want to take that file with me when I leave this computer but I don't have a flash drive with me. How am I going to be able to open the file and use it in class? In order to remedy this problem, I will email it to myself so I can access it later. The next thing we need to do is to log into our Zimbra email. We can do so by going to www.southwest.tn.edu and left clicking on webmail in the upper right corner of our page. In the username field, we type in our username. If you do not know your username, it is the first part of your email address before the at symbol. For example, if your email was fmatthews at southwest.tn.edu, then your username would be fmatthews. and your password is your email password. Now when you have those typed in,
click log in. Next, we need to compose a new email. To do this, click on the new button in the upper left. This brings up a new blank email. Now we need to add our attachment. So to do so, you need to click on the button in the middle of the options bar. At the top of the screen that says attachment, it has a paperclip symbol next to it. Once you do this, you will see an attachment files dialog box come up and ask you to choose a file to attach. Click on the first choose files button and a file open system dialog box will appear. We now need to left click on the desktop because that is where we saved our file. Now uh, scroll down the box until you see your file. It's right here in the first box. When you click on it, click on open. You can choose more than one file by using the other choose file boxes but for this example we just want one. Now click on attach and the file is now attached to your email. Now we need to address the email to ourselves. In the to box I will type in my email address which is f-m-a-t-h-e-w-s at s-o-u-t-h-w-s-t dot t-n dot e-d-u. Next, it's not necessary, but it's a good idea to put something in the subject line of the email that describes what the file is. I will type test file for lesson. That's all I need to do. Now I hit send. And as you can see, the message was sent. Now if I click on my inbox, I see I have received a message from myself. Click on the message to open it, and you can see at the top of the message is the file that we attached to our email. We can now click on that file and download it and save it. If you go to another computer and log in and open your email, you can now save this file and work on it on any computer where you have access to your email. On a side note, if you alter the file and want to save it as a new item in your email, you'll have to go through this process over again. Before we end our lesson, let's go over the key terms we learned. Attachment. This is a file that we have attached to an email and we want to send it to the email recipient which was ourselves in this lesson. Closing. Today we learned that we can save our files by emailing them to ourselves. We also learned how to add an attachment to an email. I hope you learned something and as always if you have any more questions email me at fmatthews at southwest.tn.edu Welcome to Saving Your Work in Word as a Different File Type. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to save your work in Microsoft Word as multiple file types and know some reasons why you would want to do so. When you have a document ready to save in Microsoft Word and you click Save, it saves that file as a .docx file. This is the default file type for current versions of Microsoft Word. Alternatively, when you get to the save screen, you can also choose to save your work as one of many other different file types. One of the occasions when this could be useful is if you're working on a file and you're not finished, you save your file to a flash drive to work on it later on your computer at home but your home computer is still using an older version of Microsoft Word that won't open a .docx file. Any version of Word before Word 2007 will not open .docx files. 
to get around this problem, you would need to save your file as a Word 97 2003 document, which saves it as a .doc, because all versions of Word will open a .doc file. To do this, go to the File tab in the upper left, and click on Save As. On the Save As dialog that comes up, you'll be asked where you want to save your file. Let's save it to our flash drive. For me, that's removable disk E. It might be different for you. Choose the file name that you want. We can use the default file name. And under File, there's an option that says Save As Type. If you click on the box that says Word Document, a drop-down list will appear, giving you different options on what file type you want to save your work as. There are many different options, but you'll probably never need to use most of them. For this example, you want to choose Word 97 2003 document, dot doc, left click on it, and then click save. You will now be able to open this file and work on it in your home computer and also at the computers at school. Another problem is when you don't have Microsoft Word on your home computer. If you're working on an assignment at school and you don't get it done, you need to be able to work on it at home, even if you don't have Microsoft Office. You can save your work as a rich text file and Windows will be able to open it with WordPad regardless of whether you have Microsoft Word on your computer. WordPad is a free text editing program that comes with Windows. It's not as powerful as Word, but it will work in a pinch. Let's get back to our work. Click on the File tab, click Save As, choose to save to our flash drive, removal drive E, leave the file name as it is, now click on the box beside Save As Type, in the drop down choose Rich Text Format, dot rtf click on it and now click save you can now finish your work on any windows machine regardless of whether it has word or not what if you need to save your work for someone who doesn't want to open it with any word processor in this case you'll want to save your work as a pdf a PDF can be opened on any computer that has Adobe Acrobat Reader installed, which is most computers. In order to save our work as a PDF, we will go back to our Word file. Click on the File tab in the upper left. Click on Save As. Choose our flash drive as a place to save our work. Mine is removable disk E. Change the file name to whatever you want. I'm just going to leave mine as Doc1. Now click on the box beside Save as Type, and in the drop down, click on PDF. Now click Save, and it brings up what our document looks like as a PDF in Adobe Acrobat Reader. Before we end our lesson, let's go over the key terms we learned. File Type. The file type basically describes what programs can use a file. A .doc is a Word file used by Microsoft Word, and a .pdf is a portable document file used by Adobe Acrobat Reader. PDF. This is a document type that can be opened on any computer which has Adobe Acrobat Reader installed. Adobe Acrobat Reader. This is a free document reader program distributed by Adobe which reads the .pdf file type. RTF. This stands for Rich Text Format and is a simple document file type that can be read by WordPad, a free Microsoft Word processor that saves some page formatting but does not have the advanced features of Microsoft Word. .docx. This is the current default file type that the version of Microsoft Word we use in the library will save your file as if you do not tell it to save it as a different file type. .doc. This is an older Microsoft Word file format which was created by Word 97 through Word 2003.
In this lesson, we learned how to save our work as three different file types, .doc, .rtf, and .pdf. Each of these file formats are useful and or necessary in certain circumstances. I hope you learned something, and as always, if you have any more questions, email me at fmatthews at southwest.tn.edu. Welcome to saving an article from a database to a specific location and opening it later. By the end of this lesson, you will know how to save an article from one of our many databases to a specific place on a hard drive, and then open the article later for viewing. We are going to be saving our articles in PDF format. A PDF is a document that can easily be opened on any of our computers with the Adobe Reader program. For this lesson, we will be retrieving articles from three different databases to save. Their systems are all a bit different, but I want to show you how the steps for saving an article for Health Source Nursing Academic Edition, Academic One File, and Credo Reference are all very similar. The first thing we need to do is pull up an article in each of these databases. Let's open Health Source Nursing Academic Edition in Medicine, Academic One File in General Periodicals, and Credo Reference in Electronic Books. And in each one we're going to search for health. We do a quick search for health. For health. And for health. As you can see, each page has a different layout, but there are many functional similarities. For this lesson, we need to find out where on each page it will allow us to save an article for later viewing. Let's start with Health Source Nursing Academic Edition. This is a typical article page for this database. If we want to see the PDF full text of this article, we click on the PDF full text link on the left. We can now see the entire article. In order to save this article, there is a link in the upper left corner of the page that says Download PDF. Click on that. This will open the PDF in a new window. We can now right click on the article and Save As. Be sure that when you save this document, we want to choose our flash drive on the left or the hard drive of this computer if we're going to email this article to ourselves later or put it on your Google Drive. For now I'm going to choose the C drive and I'm going to name this article something that I'll remember Health for Research and I'm going to click Save. Now let's look at an article from Academic One File. The full text comes up right as we open the article. If you look to the right, you'll see a toolbar, and one of the options is to download. Click on this option, and it will ask us what format we wish to download the article in. We want to choose PDF, and then choose Download. A Save As dialog box will come up, and we can choose our flash drive on the left movable disk E, or the hard drive of this computer, local disk C. If we're going to email this article to ourselves later, saving it on the hard drive would be a good idea. Let's name this article something that we will remember. Article from Academic One File on Health and click Save. Lastly, let's look at an article from Credo Reference. When we open an article in this database, there should be a toolbar on the upper right. On this toolbar, there is an icon that looks like a piece of paper with the letters PDF on it. If we click on this icon, a Save As dialog box will come up. We can choose our flash drive on the left, removable disk E, or the hard drive of the computer, 
local disk C. If we're going to email it to ourselves later, it's a good idea to save it in one of these places as well. Let's name the article something we'll remember. Health from Credo Reference. And click Save. We have now saved three PDF articles to a specific place on the computer, but how do we open them? I'm going to show you two ways. One of the easiest ways is to open the Adobe Reader program and then open the file from there. Go to the Windows icon in the lower left and click on All Programs, and Adobe Reader X should be at the top of the list of programs. Click on it, and the program will open. You can now open a file like you were in Word. Go to File, Open, browse to the place where we saved our files, removable disk E, and then click on one of them. I'm going to click on the Help from Credo Reference, and click Open. And this shows us our article that we saved from Creator Reverence. Alternatively, if you cannot find the Adobe Reader program, you can just double click on the file itself and open it. To do this, click on the Windows icon in the lower left of the screen, then click on Computer. Now let's click on the hard drive or flash drive where we saved our PDF. I saved mine on removable disk E. Now navigate through the items on the drive until you see your PDF. I see it right here, Health from Credo Reference. Double click on the PDF file and it will open in the default program for that type of file, which is the Adobe Reader. Before we end our lesson, let's go over the key terms we learned. Database. A database is a collection of materials that you can search through for specific information full text. If an article is full text, it means that the database has access to the entire text of the article that you wish to view. Not all articles are full text. Some only have descriptions of the articles and you have to look elsewhere for the content of the article. Download. In order to use a file on your computer, you need to download it. This simply means that you're saving it to your computer or hard drive or flash drive. Today we learned how to save a PDF article from three different databases. Most databases you encounter will be similar to one of these three in how they handle the saving of articles. We also learned how to open an article that we may have saved for later viewing. I hope you learned something, and as always, if you have any more questions, please email me at fmatthews at southwest.tn.edu. Welcome to How to Find an eBook using Southwest Tennessee Community College Library Resources and how to either view it online or download it and view it offline. By the end of this video, you should be able to locate an eBook in the library catalog, view it from a web page, download it to a file if desired, and open that file for later reading. There are multiple ways to get eBooks from the InfoNet Library. But one of the simplest is to find them in the library catalog. Let's open the CyberCat library catalog web page. In order to do this, we can go to the main southwest.tn.edu page, click on library. On the right, click on the tab that says resources. And in the resources list, click on CyberCat online catalog. This will bring us to lib2.southwest.tn.edu. Now that we've arrived at the library catalog, we can search for a book. Let's search for books on nursing. I will type nursing in the search box and click submit. On the results page, the icon on the right tells us what type of material each record is. 
as you can see we have physical books and also CDs films and if we scroll down we can see that we also have ebooks let's click on one of the links labeled ebook on the record page it gives us basic information about the book and it also has a box that says click on the following two and a link to the ebook different ebook pages may have links that are worded slightly differently but it will always be a page with a box that says click on the following with a link to the book underneath if we click on the link it'll bring us to the ebook web page this is one of our EBSCO ebooks we have ebooks with other services as well and their interfaces may look slightly different but they have the same main features to view the book we can either click on the link on the left that says ebook full text or we can click on any of the links in the table of contents and choose a certain part of the book we'd like to view let's click on ebook full text this takes us to the beginning of the book we can use the arrows at the bottom of the page to navigate forwards or backwards through the pages of the book. But what if we want to download the book to view it later when we're not online? We only own one copy of each book, so when you do this, you're checking the book out for a certain number of days, and no one else can use it until your checkout has expired. On the left, there's a link that says download this ebook offline. When we click on this link, it needs us to log into our EBSCO account. If we don't have one, we click on create new account and it will bring up a simple page that we can fill out quickly. I will just log into my account. You will now be presented with a dialog box which gives you the title of the book and asks you to specify the checkout period. The checkout period is how many days the book you download will be available for you to view offline. During this time period no one else can look at the book online and when the time period is up the file that you have will stop working and the book will be available on the website again. The viewing requirements will also let you know what kind of program you'll need to open this book. Make sure you only check it out for the amount of time you actually need it. I'm going to check this book out for one day, but you can check one out for up to seven days. Click on Save, and a File Save dialog box should appear. We want to name our file Library Book. We want to save it on the desktop and click save. As you can see it saves it as a .acsm file. We have now downloaded an ebook and checked it out for one day. If we want to open this file the system told us what we needed in viewing requirements. I'm on a Windows computer, so I'm going to use Adobe Digital Editions. If you do not have this free program, you can download it from www.adobe.com slash products slash digital hyphen editions slash download dot html. When I double click on the file I downloaded, it will all automatically open it with Adobe Digital Editions. It fulfills the content and I can now read the book offline. Before we end our lesson, let's go over the key terms we learned. Ebook an ebook is an electronic book that can be viewed either through a web browser or using an ebook reader program offline. .acsm An ACSM file is an Adobe Content Server message file. 
It can be opened by Adobe Digital Editions to view our ebook content. Closing. Today we learned how to find an ebook, view it online, and download it and view it offline. I hope you learned something, and as always, if you have any more questions, email me at fmatthews at southwest.tn.edu. Welcome to using Google Drive to save your work in the cloud. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to set up a Google Drive account, upload a file to your Google Drive, and download that file to a different location. You may have heard talk of people saving their work to the cloud. All this means is that they're saving their work to a remote hard drive that they access over the internet. This is what Google Drive is. It is disk space on a remote hard drive that you can access from anywhere you have internet access. You can think of it as a flash drive that's stored on the internet. This can be useful if you forgot to bring your flash drive with you to the library, or you have work that won't fit on your flash drive. The first thing we need to do is go to the Google website by typing into our address bar www.google.com and hitting enter. In order to use Google Drive, you must first sign into your Google account. Sign in is in the upper right. If you have a Gmail account, then you can just use that username to log in. The username would be your Gmail email address and email password. If you do not have a Google account, then click on Sign Up in the upper right hand side of the screen. Fill out all the information on this screen, then click Next Step. For this example, I will just create a random account with random information. Random, random, southwest, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. birthday, just a random day. Okay, type in the verification, J-O-H-N-M-A-Y-E-D-E-F. Okay, agree to the privacy policy, click next step and now you have created a Google account. Now remember this username and password. We're going to need it later to log back into our account. It would be a good idea to write it down somewhere. Okay. Go to the choices at the top of the screen and choose Drive. You're now in your Google Drive account. It's currently empty. In order to add information to this account, you need to upload a file. The red button with the white up arrow and a line under it is the upload button. Click on it and it will ask you if you want to upload files or folders. For this example, let's upload a file. Click on the upload button, click on files, and an open dialog box will appear. We now need to choose the file we want to upload to our Google Drive. I will choose a Word file I have saved on the desktop. I'll click on Desktop, and as you can see, there's only one Word file. I will click on it, and I will now click Open. When the upload is complete, it will say Uploaded, and it says Upload Complete at the top of this box. I now see the file is in a list on the page. Test file for Google account .docx. Let's click on the checks box beside it. And now we can see what options we have to manipulate this file. Click on more in the top near the middle. As you can see there are many options. 
but for our purposes all I want to do is download the file so I'll click on download a save as dialog box comes up asking me where I want to save my file to I will save it to my flash drive in this case it's removable disk E and I will click on save we have now uploaded a file to a Google Drive account and then downloaded it to a new location let's start from the beginning once for practice close your browser open the browser back up go to www.google.com now in the middle you should see drive if you don't see it it might be in more but we see it in the middle of the screen click on drive we're still signed in let's sign out go to the upper right click on your username sign out okay now we want to sign in use the username we created earlier mine was southwest123456678 at gmail but whatever yours was put it in now put in your password and click sign in we now see the file that we uploaded earlier click on the checkbox to the left of the file click on more in the upper middle click on download I'm going to choose to download it into documents and I'm going to click save and we have retrieved our file we can now save this file on any computer that has internet access that will allow us to log into our Google Drive account. Before we end our lesson, let's go over the key terms that we learned. Upload. Uploading a file is the process of saving a file to a remote location on the internet. You can think of it like this. When you download a file, you bring it down from the internet to your computer but when you upload a file you put it up onto the internet from your computer the cloud the cloud refers to a remote web storage service which allows you to save your data on a web server and access it at any time you have access to an internet connection google drive this is a service provided by google where they save your files online and give you access to them anywhere you can log into your google account in this lesson we learned how to create a Google Drive account, how to log into that account, how to upload a file onto this account, and how to download a file from this account to a different location. I hope you learned something, and as always, if you have any more questions, please email me at fmatthews at southwest.tn.edu. Welcome to opening and creating a zip file. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to recognize what a zip file is, unzip slash open a zip file, and create a zip file of your own. Sometimes your professor will send you a zip file, or you'll find a zip file online containing information you need for class. A zip file is a compressed archive file that either holds a group of files or holds one file that is compressed, which means it takes up less space than usual on the hard drive. You can think of it as putting files in a folder which can be manipulated as if it were a single file. When you open this zip file, which is also called unzipping it, you retrieve all the files inside the zip file and unzip them to a specific location on your computer. Creating a zip file can be useful when you want to send someone multiple files at once or when a professor wants to make several files available but wants you to be able to download them all with one click. You can identify a file as a zip file by the .zip file extension. The icon for a zip file is typically a folder with a zipper on the side. It may look differently depending on what version of Windows you're using 
or what zipping programs you have installed on your computer. If you double click on the zip file it will bring up a window showing you all the files that are on the zip file. This lets you see the files but they're still not unzipped and you cannot use them yet. In order to use these files we need to unzip the zip file. To do this right click on the zip file and you should see the option to extract all. Click on that. Windows will then ask you for a place you would like to unzip the files to. Click browse and then my computer and let's choose our flash drive. For me it's removable disk E. Hit OK. The dialog box now shows that the files will be extracted to our flash drive, drive E. Now click extract and depending on how big the zip file is it may take a few seconds to unzip all the files but since this was a very small file it unzipped them pretty much immediately. We can now go to my computer go to our removable disk and we see that all of the files are now on our flash drive. It's fairly simple to make a zip file from a group of files on your computer. Let's say we have five Word documents on our desktop. We can click and drag to highlight all five documents, then right click on one of the documents. On the menu that appears we choose Send To, Compressed Zipped Folder, left click on that. This will create a zip file at the same location that contains all the files you had highlighted. It will name the zip file the name of the file that you right clicked. You can now move all these files at once by moving the zip file to a flash drive or you can add it as an attachment to an email. If we double click on it, we can see that it contains all five of our files. Before we end our lesson, let's go over the key terms we learned. Archive. An archive is one file that contains a group of files. Compressed file. A compressed file is a file that has been saved in a format that takes up less disk space than a normal file. Zip file. A zip file is an archive file that is commonly used to transport multiple files at once or to compress large files. Extract files. To extract files means you make copies of all the files inside of an archive file, like a zip file, and save them to a new location. Today we learned what a zip file is and how to open one. We also learned some uses for zip files and how we can easily create them for ourselves. I hope you learned something and as always if you have any more questions email me at fmatthews at southwest.tn.edu. Welcome to Taking a Screenshot. By the end of this lesson you should be able to create an image file based on what is currently on your screen and save it as a file that you can attach to an email. First of all, you might be asking, what is a screenshot? A screenshot is just the name for an image that shows a snapshot of what is on your computer screen. The next question you might be asking is, why would I need to take a screenshot? Well, there are many reasons to take a screenshot. You may want to show someone a problem that is occurring on your screen that's hard to describe in words. You may want to document something someone said in a web chat. You may need to have an image proving you went to a particular website, completed an assignment, or ran a particular program on the computer. Whatever your reason, there's a simple way to take a screenshot and save it for later use. To take a screenshot, you simply need to press the Print Screen key on the upper right of your keyboard. This takes a snapshot of your current screen and saves it to a part of memory called the clipboard. When something is on the clipboard, then we can right-click and choose Paste to paste a copy of what is on the clipboard into a program. 
the program we're going to be pasting into is MS Paint. First thing we need to do is hit print screen to take our snapshot. The next thing we need to do is go to the start menu in the bottom left, click on all programs, click on accessories, and click on paint. Now that we have paint open, click on select. Now right click on the empty white area, click on paste, and the image of our screen will be pasted onto the program. Now that we have an image pasted, we can save it. Click on the symbol that looks like a page with a down arrow beside it in the upper left. and move your mouse down to hover over save as. On the right you will see options as to what file type you can save your picture as PNG, JPEG, BMP, etc. In order to make the file size small and in order to make it easy to open the file later let's choose JPEG. Move your mouse over JPEG and click it this will put up the save as dialog box you can choose where to save your file I'm just going to save mine to the desktop we can click save and we now have a picture of what was on our computer screen and we can email it to someone so they can see for themselves Before we end our lesson, let's go over the key terms we learned. Screenshot. A screenshot is a picture of what is currently shown on your computer monitor. Clipboard. The clipboard is the area of temporary memory that data goes to when you use the copy command, and also when you hit the print screen button. When there is information on the clipboard, you can paste it into a program. JPEG. A JPEG is an image file that can be easily viewed in an email. Today we learned how to take a screenshot, how to paste it into MS Paint, and how to save it as a file. I hope you learned something, and as always, if you have any more questions, email me at fmatthews at southwest.tn.edu.